Hare Krishna, Krishna Dharma Prabhu. Please welcome to the Monk podcast. You Thank know, you. Uh, your Ramayana and Mahabharat were the books that after Lilamrat, they're the books I, on the first reading, I fell in love with those books. The I had read the Ramayana and the Mahabharata since my childhood or read and watched and heard about it. But the, the flair of language that you have, uh, which you bring, you bring, you have visual evocative power to your language. That was amazing. And so many devotees across the world, whenever they ask which Ramayana and Mahabharata I should uh, to read, I recommend yours. And so many devotees yeah. after reading it, they say, this is so amazing. We wish we had read this long before. So I'm glad you like it. It's, it's wonderful to have you here today. Thank you very Thank much you. for coming Prabhu. Thank you for your, mm. your kind words, Prabhu. Thank you very much. Yes. So, so Prabhu, I thought today we could discuss about these books. Now in India, we use the word epics for them, but, uh, yeah. I think in the West, the word epics have some other ideas, uh, evoke some other images. Yeah, yeah I mean, certainly um, they won't think of Mahabharata or Ramayan. They'll think of something like Homer or Gilgamesh, you know, that kind of thing. Perhaps these days, Lord of the Rings, <laughs> Lord of the <laughs> you Rings. know, but uh, yeah. yeah, but not, um, yeah, not the Indian epics. Yes. Um... But uh, yes, they are indeed epics. So, uh, but how can you say how, how you got interested in uh, retelling them and in retelling what exactly yeah. do you do? Yes, exactly. Well, I um, I mean, it, it was my very deep love for the Mahabharat and Ramayana that inspired me to to write them. I, I, I read them. I, I can't actually read Sanskrit, so I read them in translation. Um, and I don't know if you've seen. For example, um, Ganguly um, or Dutt, but they're, they're very stilted English, very old style. Um, and I enjoyed it. I mean, I like poetry. I, I read classical poets from the last century and, you know, the last couple of centuries. I really enjoy that kind of thing. So I, I found that most people would not be able to read that or, you know, would find it a bit heavy going. But at the same time, I was so struck by the beauty of the Mahabharata and the Ramayana of the poetry, the descriptions, of the high virtue, the characters, the drama, everything about it. I found it so so amazing and wonderful. I thought, well, if I could share this with others, that might be a nice service. Um, and I knew a little bit about writing and I actually took some other writing courses around that time um, to try and improve my ability. Uh, and I actually first wrote the Ramayan and um, I had no aspirations for publication, to be honest with you. I thought, oh, really? well, I, I don't know if anyone's going to publish this. It's, it's not the kind of thing that, you know, I mean, there's already, there was already a lot of other translations available. So I, I wasn't very ambitious about getting it published. And I, I thought maybe, you know, it would help my children and perhaps a few other people if I can, you know, maybe self-publish or something. But fortunately, um, I, I did find someone. There was a devotee at the time who was... Uh, who was doing um, a publishing uh, Torchlight, Advaita Chandra Prabhu. Yes. Um, and he, he picked it up and, um, and you know, it seemed, to, um, it seemed to take off. It, it, did, it did really well, actually. More so the Mahabharata. The Ramayana is popular among devotees and in India, but the Mahabharata actually has been very popular even in a broader uh, Western market. So, yeah, it was, it was mostly my love and desire to share it with others that inspired me. That's amazing. So when you yeah. wrote it, you were, you had no, like a clear plan for publishing also. So you wrote just for yourself. No. Okay. Yeah, I, I, I did. I mean, I, I, I just, um, I, I just wanted, it. it was just something inside me that it, it, it was kind of bursting out of me. I had to do it. <laughs> it was one of those things, you know, amazing. and, um, so how do you? Yeah, really... it, 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 it's it was. I was so inspired by it personally. Hmm. And had you written yeah. anything in your pre-devotional life or in your devotional life till then? Or no, this was your first books. No books. I, I, I mean, I'd written 
very, you know, I dabbled with it, I, I, poetry and articles and things like that. Um, I'd written oh, quite a lot of commentary. Um, I'd written for the BBC that they were um, getting me to do broadcasts and things like that. So, but no major works, no no books as such. So th that was my first um, the first book I wrote was the Ramayan. Oh. Um, so BBC and then the Mahabharata pretty soon after. Sorry, BBC uh, broadcast. Yeah, BBC broadcast. Like, radio uh, or they, they, um, I beg your pardon. Was it radio or was it articles? A uh, radio. I was right. I, I was doing. Um, yeah, you ha I had to write scripts for um, different things like prayer for the day, pause for thought, things like that. So I was, I was doing that. Um, and I wrote articles. I had been published. I'd published in The Guardian, The Independent, some newspapers in this country. So I'd managed to you know, get a, a few articles published by them. Um, so, I mean, I had a real interest in writing. I enjoyed it very much. But... Uh, I'd never really thought of writing a book. I, I didn't want to write a novel. I've, I've never been um, <laughs> interested in fiction as such. So, uh, but then the Ramayana was perfect. I mean, I've read, like, for example, Lord of the Rings and um, yeah, some of the other epics, Sophocles, that kind of thing. But they'd always been very empty and soulless. I, I, you know, the, although the, the language was nice and... Um, and I, I quite enjoyed reading them, but still there was something missing that I found in the Mahabharata and I found in the Ramayana that, that it had a deeper spiritual meaning. Um, it was actually something profound uh, and not just uh, like Lord of the Rings, for example. There's themes running through that. It was written by um, Tolkien, who was a Christian. So he, he you know, he wove in different um, themes of virtue and that kind of thing, but nothing explicit and certainly no spiritual messages were there. So it, it leaves you feeling a little empty. This, it's not satisfying on a, on a spiritual level, but the, the, you know, the Indian epics, the Mahabharata, the Ramayana, they really are. Um, and, and I think that was one of the main things that appealed to me. That's, that's interesting. So you, so in a sense, if I, if when I read your books, you, there is no preaching in the books, in either the Ramayana or the Mahabharata. It's, it, there is no commentary or there is no, if the word preaching has a negative connotation, but there is no even direct teaching of values. So you feel no. that even through just the storyline and the discussions, some values get conveyed and you feel even devotional values get conveyed, even for a Western audience. They do. Yeah, I mean, I think the um, the whole aim of the um, of those epics is is to show, not tell, more than anything, through the lives of the characters, through um, you know the 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 different um, results that they achieve in their lives, whether they're the the villains or the good guys, um, they get very different results from their from their uh, activities, and and you can see in that um, that that conveys the lesson. Um, through stories, the best way really to convey uh, teachings, morals, ethics, spirituality is through stories. Uh, and, and I think this is the earliest example of that. Vyasadeva knew that well and Valmiki um, telling these stories in such a beautiful poetic way uh, with, you know, with nice dramatic uh, effects and everything. Uh, it, it gets across the messages you don't, you don't have to explicitly um, tell them. It's sufficient just to, to read the stories and, and hear about these, these great personalities. Yes. You know, when I think about the epics, there are multiple things which are attractive. And the story itself is attractive. The values conveyed through the stories are attractive. And also, the, uh, the, as you said, Ramayana, Ramayana is exquisite poetry. So the format of the literature also is attractive. So in some way, yeah. we as a movement, um, we have transmitted the wisdom in various languages, but uh, to transmit it in a beautiful format, that in a, like, as you said, a poetic format or a literary appealing format, that especially in English has not been done much. If I look at India, 
you know the sanskrit ramayan is popular but it is quite a the vernacular ramayans that actually spread the appeal of the ramayan all over the country so in some ways english is a international language so maybe the vernacularization of ramayan in english may not be the right word but we i think your book is one of the first and most prominent contributions in in presenting it in a form that is appreciable simply for its literary value also the writing and yeah. uh, the elegance in it yeah thank you I, i mean yes of course prior to me there had been other versions but one of the things i'd noticed about them um i, I read the mahabharata by kamala subramanian for example and arkane narayan is another author and um uh go uh, i forget his name but um The, 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 there was another famous one, shorter version, but all of them I found um, didn't really convey the real spiritual import um, that's implicit in in the text. They, uh, you, you know, there's, there's a certain message there which um, the author is trying to get across, uh, and I found it obscured in in these other versions, and and that was something that troubled me. Uh, and that was another reason why I felt inspired to try and present the epics and and retain that message, um, and you know it, it, keep it intact the uh, the actual spiritual teachings that are most important, in fact, um, and that I found had been obscured or, or misinterpreted or even just twisted a little bit in other versions. To be honest. that's true you know it was since uh, after i read your ramayan i also started ramayan and mahabharat i started speaking it on an exten- extensively and i found that uh, even a direct spiritual message if it is conveyed through stories from the ramayan and the mahabharat it becomes so more much more attractive and uh, we can use some stories from non scriptural sources also to convey certain points and lessons but if we have stories available from our scriptures then then using them is even more authentic and enriching and purifying yes that, that that's what i i thought yeah i mean we you're saying we can come up with other stories of our own perhaps we can you know write some novels or different things like that or um borrow from other cultures but the the most powerful way to convey the message is through the stories that are found in in our own writings and our own texts um like the mahabharata the ramayana and the shrimad bhagavatam which we can talk about after as well yes definitely so you know with respect to the uh, values so i have also started writing on the ramayana now i have published one book another book is soon to come and then once yes i've seen that they're very good yeah so you know i thought of at three levels so there is there are devotional values then we could say there are ethical or human values and then beyond that uh, there are certain uh, culture specific values so that means certain decisions which the characters take in the ramayana the mahabharat it can seem uh, very difficult for us to why did they do like that so there are some spiritual values which are easy to understand some ethical values say for example ram obeying his father or Ra, uh, bharat sacrificing but not wanting to take the kingdom that fell upon him that came to him so selflessness dutifulness some values are relatively easy to understand so there are directly devotional values there are ethical values and then if i may use the word there are controversial values that means why the characters over there act that way it can see say for example say why ram banish sita or some things like that or some of the situations when in the mahabharat the uh, some of the characters on the kaurava side are killed in ways that seem less than ethical so now when you when you were translating it at that time or did you because you are not really giving a commentary to it so did you 
anticipate what kind of questions your audience would get and did you try to address that or your focus was let the story speak for itself yeah um okay so yeah you're asking that there are some um spiritual points in the epics which are difficult to comprehend um and which go you know seem intuitively the wrong thing like why did ram banish sita that creates yeah. a great deal of doubt or why did yudhisthira gamble lose yeah. his brothers and everything so yeah um so so that you're saying did i think that that needed some commentary some explanation yes or did i just allow the story to to you know explain it for itself and i think um the way i the way i handled that was uh, to try and give an insight into the inner dialogue of the characters what was moving them to do what they did like uh, with ram i mean it it's a little difficult with uh, divinities like lord ram to give the inner dialogue but you get some insights um from you know from the author uh, and from the commentators from the acharyas so um working with that i was able to hopefully convey some of the deeper um you know the deeper reasons behind those activities which are difficult to understand um such as uh, sita's banishment and um such as the way that yudhisthira acted in in the mahabharata and that kind of thing so um and you you can see by the way he, he's thinking that he's like yudhisthira I'm talking about now he's connecting with krishna and he's thinking always in terms of what does krishna want what does god want for me in this situation because a personality like that can't think in any other way it, it, you know a, a great soul a great devotee of krishna can only think in terms of what does krishna want he never thinks in terms of his own senses his own mind his own desires so mm-hmm. on that level he, and he's also being moved from within by the super soul so you know all of these things in other words are going on as a part of a much higher divine plan mm. so the you know the challenge was to try and get that across to show that uh, and, and help people to understand that this wasn't a personality who was overcome by lust by greed by anger or envy like us because that's the problem we tend to superimpose those things onto those characters because that's how we would act mm. in that situation that would be how we would think but they don't think in the same way they're very different to us so the you know what i tried to do is to show that to to bring that out that here is a person not like you not like me who's acting from another level completely uh which is completely pure uh and without any trace of ignorance um and and then it becomes a little clearer what's what's happening yes true so overall do you see over the years uh, the popularity of the ramayana and the mahabharat in the western world has also increased or how do you see the overall effect on the culture has it increased i i, I mean i think it's slowly increasing there's nothing dramatic happening in that respect um it, there, there, there's definitely an interest which is consistent uh i it has a little bit recently i think um with my books i find I, I, you know there's been i i've just changed publishers uh, my previous publisher unfortunately went out of business and so now um i'm with mandala um the, the, a different publisher and they and they've just re-released my books so for a little while they weren't actually uh, available they were uh, out of print but um they've just come back but uh, all throughout that time i've actually had them available as audiobooks and uh, there's been a growing um interest in that 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 the sales of the audiobooks have been steadily increasing so um but it, it, i mean it's not massive it's it, you know it's not selling on the level of harry potter or anything like that i wish <laughs> but uh, for what it is it's it's surprise it holds up surprisingly well so yes in the western market especially the mahabharat the ramayan is not so well known that um in the west it you know doesn't sell so well but in india obviously it's very popular that's interesting and in asia you know all around asia 
Now that's interesting because Ramayan is in some ways far more popular in India than the Mahabharat. And that's correct. Yeah. Recently, during the COVID pandemic, when the Indian government had imposed a lockdown uh, in India, because more many people have small houses and not very good ventilation, keeping people inside is difficult. So one of the things the government did was it rebroadcast the Ramayana and the Mahabharat popular serials which had been come in the 1980s and 90s. And they had the, the Ramayana rebroadcast had the all time highest viewership among all programs all over the world. So, wow. so it seems that it is enormously popular. So in India, Ramayana is much more popular than Mahabharat. So you are saying in the West, it is opposite. Any reason for that? Um, I think the Mahabharat has, uh, why is it more popular? I, I think because people are more aware of the Bhagavad Gita, perhaps, and obviously that's a chapter in the Mahabharat. Um, and the Mahabharat uh, actually was broadcast on television in this country. Um, the, the, I think, was it by Chopra? That, that one that had 90 yeah. episodes. Yeah. And, uh, and it was very popular. It attracted up to 2 million viewers, surprisingly, even, even though it wasn't the most polished of <laughs> things yeah. like, you know, with, in terms of the special effects and everything else. But the story itself is it's so wonderful and so profound and so, you know, perennial. It's the, the messages and everything. And um, that it, it, it appealed to quite a broad audience. And, I think that helped. Another thing that helped was um, there was a play by Peter Brooks um, of the Mahabharat. It's like a five hour long presentation. Uh, and, and that was, it was done in a very sort of art nouveau, avant-garde kind of way, but um, it, it appealed to, uh, you know, to the Western mind. And I think that also served to increase awareness of that book. Uh, and, um, you know, one thing or another, it's it's kind of stayed there in the public mind, and uh, and I find I find that Mahabharat sells probably three times as many as the Ramayana um, overall in the West. But as you say, in India, it's a different story, of course. So this is not just for your book in general. Uh, from what you know, Mahabharat is more popular in the Western world than than Ramayana. Not just your book, or you well, I, I mean, I don't. No, particularly. I mean, since I've written mine, other authors have come onto the scene. Dave Duck, uh, uh, Dave Dat Nayak has written one that's quite popular. Um, and uh, another author, author whose name eludes me currently, but there's been a couple of popular versions come out. Uh, and I've, I've watched their sales, you know, <laughs> uh, to see how they get on. And um, I, I think it's generally true of all versions, to be honest with you, yeah. Oh, okay. I think so. And uh, so when we talk about the, in India, many of the epics, even I grew up reading the Ramayana and the Mahabharat, we knew that the uh, Ram was God, but often the focus was not on primarily devotional values. It was also on, as I said, human values. So family values about how a younger brother should obey the older brother or how say uh, a wife should be chased to the husband or how one should obey one's parents like from the Ramayana or how one's family should be united in the, from the Pandavas. So in some ways, it does seem that uh, a culture cannot directly or exclusively focus only on spiritual values. It also needs ethical fabric. And these epics, they work at both levels. At one level, they strengthen the ethical fabric of society. At another level, they also provide spiritual inspiration. So, <clears throat> so now, there are a number of authors in India who put the spiritual aspect aside and they focus on drawing... Uh, we could say not just ethical lessons, but almost utilitarian lessons. So for example, we have Mahabharat for managers or Ramayana for leaders or, or Ramayana wisdom for today's world or something like that. And uh, 
to some extent some of the lessons drawn from them are are sound some of them are a little stretched some of them almost uh, misrepresent the characters and their motivations to draw some lessons so in general uh, what are your thoughts about say using the epic to teach certain lessons what would be the limits for doing that say in your case you let the story teach itself but not everyone may pick up the lessons uh, so well if if they're not explicitly brought out so any thoughts about okay. that yeah okay um so yeah you're saying that uh, nowadays there's a tendency to extract from the epics ethical lessons moral lessons even um lessons in management business that kind of thing yes. um and people write books which are focused on those particular areas and they use the the epics to illustrate them through the examples of the various characters in the way they deal with each other and that kind of thing yes. um and and they leave out even you saying you know they they uh, exclude the spiritual message they don't really focus on that at all um so you know one of my thoughts i i think um first of all um ethics without spirituality is is really um meaningless i mean it's um it, it, it the, the 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 ethics and the morals of the uh the vedic literatures the epic of the epics come out of the spiritual foundation um if you remove that then you know religion without uh philosophy without religion is, is speculation you're really left um without much uh basis for 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 what you're presenting so i i don't see that it's possible to di divest the um ethical message the the spiritual message from the ethical message the the two are intertwined in my mind um and it's essential to keep them that way so that people understand because you were asking questions um about the activities of some of the um major characters principal characters Uh, which from uh, a mundane ethical point of view mm. are questionable um and and you can only make sense of those if you understand the spiritual foundation that underlies um otherwise you're going to be you know left thinking well there's something wrong with that uh, but why because you have your own idea of morality and ethics which is who knows where that's coming from you know from your cultural conditioning perhaps from some other scriptures you know like in the west people's ethics and morality tends to be um coming from a christian background whether or not they're aware of it or they're prepared to admit to it that's where it's coming from um so morality really does stem from uh, spirituality so I, i i don't think you can divorce the two um but i do think you can get lessons uh which are pertinent to modern life from from the epics ethical and moral lessons I, i really do and i think that was part of the um the reason why they were uh, composed like for example the mahabharat um specifically was composed for certain classes of people who would find it difficult to directly approach more elevated vedic texts like the vedanta sutra or the vedas themselves so the uh, the mahabharat was written for persons much like ourselves in this day and age mm. who really find it hard to read the upanishads or to you know to read vedanta sutra so it's got these wonderful stories and um and and these high moral examples um are are in are in the book and um and these are meant for, to inspire us to a higher behavior because to really get to the spiritual you have to go to the um to what we call of course the mode of goodness you have to rise up to goodness to in in your thoughts and deeds you have to be acting not from the position of passion ignorance you know lust and greed and that kind of thing but from somewhere else from a higher position so the epics can inspire you towards that bring you up towards that so that you're more susceptible to the spiritual messages you you can begin to understand and grasp those so i do think it's important that we glean from them the the moral teachings the ethical teachings but at the same time uh, not lose sight 
of the spirituality that these come from. Yes, that is. If you see what I mean. Yeah, yeah, it's true. Very clear. And you know, I remember reading one of the reviews of your books. Some, some you got some awards also for your books. But one of the reviews was that that these epics are very violent, and there is not just violence or elaborate description of violence. There is also celebration of violence. So in today's, today's world, where there's religious extremism and uh, there's fear of violence, there's fear of violence in the name of religion. Do you face that as a obstacle for people in appreciating the epics? Um, <laughs> yeah, it's possible. Uh, funnily enough, someone came to me the other day and uh, they said that, um, "Oh, I've just been listening to your Mahabharat, and wow, it's 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 really been very helpful because before." Uh, I was always wondering why the uh, Bhagavad Gita was spoken on a battlefield. And, uh, you know, it's, it's like this profound spiritual text, and it's in the context of a great battle where millions of people are being killed. Mm. So um, I, I think, you know, the Mahabharata does, of course, explain the background for that. But um, violence, I don't think it's celebrated um, so much in... Um, in, in the epics, I mean, it's there, obviously. And for example, this battle of Kurukshetra, out of which the Bhagavad Gita came, um, was an 18 day war um, fought only among um, warriors whose specific calling um, and ability and training um, and everything was towards that kind of activity. They, they were uh, warriors at heart. That, that was what they liked to do. So they may celebrate, you know, you, you hear them glorifying battle and everything because that's their nature. That's what they like to do. But there was no, um, like today, for example, bombing of civilians and attacking of innocent people um, at that time. It was really conducted among um, the, the warrior classes and only for a specific period of time. I mean, that particular battle was considered to be very long extended fight it was 18 days i mean nowadays a war goes on for years and years it's ridiculous but then it was okay let's just deal with this it, every other avenue would be explored and the mahabharat says who is that fool who would fly to war when any other option is open so every other option was explored every kind of diplomacy they would start you know try to make friendship uh, give gifts and, you know, different things and then whatever, you know, the, the different forms of diplomacy would be employed. And if all that failed, then it may have to be settled with cold steel on the field of battle. You know, they would say, OK, it's come to that, you know, but but that was very last resort. Um, and only if there was no other way. And I think we have to say that, you know, no, no society can possibly endure without some measure of violence. You know, the police force, the armies are required. I mean, how would you feel? How would anyone feel if they were faced with an attack by some opposing element, the terrorism or something, and there was no violence available to um, repel them? There, were no, there was no army. Of course, we need that. So it, it, it's an essential part of any society, really. Yeah. I'm... But, in, you know, judiciously. Judiciously. Yeah, I agree with you fully on this point. You know, one of the things I used to explain out you rightly said is that it was between it never civilians were involved. It was fought among warriors. And even then they had code of ethics. Another thing is that it is it was not really we could say uh, it was not so much a war like in today's war when it's a, a, some violence in the name of religion. It is based on we could say religious intolerance that you don't agree with my beliefs. Therefore, I will, I will destroy you. But there, as you rightly said in the Mahabharata Ramayana, it's not so much about one's particular say who it's more about wrongdoing, not so much about believing because the Kauravas, they did serious wrongs. The Ravan did serious wrongs. So in a sense, although the war is fought to establish dharma, it is not religious violence in the sense that it is today. Religious violence today is that where one religion wants to wipe out another religion. Whereas there, it was more of to establish order in society. 
it is not necessary that i want to impose your religion on other on your my religion on your religion it was so although the uh, epics themselves are religious the wars themselves are not fought to say further a religious agenda of imposing one religion on another they are fought more to remove wrong doers and establish you could say a proper order in society that's correct yeah yeah you're saying that nowadays um so called religious wars are conducted between two opposing parties who are trying to assert their particular faith you know their their understanding over the other uh, and it's in intolerance really that that we're talking about that you know that they're trying like the crusades or or the uh, islamic conquests of you know centuries yeah. ago um that that was more about you know asserting their beliefs over others um but the 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 wars and fights that we find in the vedic scriptures in the epics um is about establishing righteousness um yeah. and um trying to dharma the the code of dharma as as you stated um and and that's a fact yeah i mean of course they'll argue that today they'll say no our religion is dharma and theirs is atharma um so <laughs> you know before we can really enter into that kind of discussion we have to establish well what are we talking about when we say dharma you know what is god's will um and, and um how how can we execute that what what does it mean what does it look like um and, and uh, otherwise it, it's because they will say that i think both sides like the crusades for example we 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 are establishing christianity which is the only true and right path you know christ said i am the way the truth and the light and so all of these other heathens they need to be converted <laughs> so they, they saw it in those terms but the, but we have to question well were they right i mean was there uh understanding of um dharma of religion actually correct according to um the scriptures even the scriptures that they follow themselves uh were they getting it right and uh, and what was the result what did we see as a result of that um did did it usher in uh an age of piety of happiness like for example when yudhisthira um after winning the battle we hear about the the reign of yudhisthira and 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 how um there was no amongst the people in general um everyone was happy there was no suffering there was great wealth and opulence when you read about the the great kingdoms of the past that were ruled over by dharmic rulers by you know the vedic rulers um they were wonderful uh, societies where everyone was peaceful and happy in fact it said that that they, they were so um connected with the hierarchy of cosmic um you know uh, 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 authority going up to god that that there wasn't even premature death there wasn't um uh you know natural calamities nat- natural disasters all of the things we experience now due to the leadership that was enlightened leadership that was dharma you know so um that they were aiming for that ideal to get to that sort of level so that everyone would be peaceful everyone would be happy everyone would be aligned with the purpose of life and satisfied fulfilled you know these were the markers that that we that we need to look for uh, if someone's claiming yes we have the right path okay can you show us that now are, are these markers visible in your society is this the case is this what you're trying to give to the world you know what are you actually trying to give to the world you know you look at their society and it's riven by conflict by so many problems you know by violence by by so many nasty things that are going on that's their society and they want to give that to the rest of the world you know so we can you know we have to be intelligent to really analyze these things and see them in terms of uh in in terms of the shastra scriptures really yeah that's true so, uh, actually everybody will have everybody will believe that what they are doing is right so any yeah. religion that is fighting will claim that god is on their side or claim that their side is virtuous but we need some Correct, yeah. parameters so can we say that those objects say like the four pillars of dharma say truthfulness mercifulness purity uh, we can say that those are almost non sectarian parameters isn't it yes universal about? principles yeah, yeah. So, 
So we talk about them in the terms of the application of the four regulatory principles. At the same time, the four regulatory principles are meant to further certain values, and those we those we could say are universal virtues. So in that sense, yes. uh, any if if a war is being fought, then and it is in the name of in the name of God's will or whatever, what is the result? Is it fostering these yes. values or is it is it only perpetuating the perpetuating say the tyranny of one ruler or one religion or another one ruler or another yes yeah. it's about yeah false ego just you know asserting their way is the right way and and that's it you know and and exploitation it's marked by you know exploitation of large sections of the population um by the leaders and suppression oppression uh, all of these things are visible um i mean in india you know you've <laughs> you've had to put up with uh, invaders and conquerors uh, on a number of occasions and yeah. you know what it feels like you know yeah. it wasn't exactly an enlightened leadership that's true and uh, yeah, this taking this point forward to about the violence now the when we discuss the epics there is a certain amount of uh, we could say creative license that is there in say in reading in depicting the minds of the characters or in rendering the speech into contemporary appealing english you know i read in one i read one translator's book about translation and he said that every translation is an interpretation because you could what word you choose that also determines to certain extent so i believe that uh, this you are doing this even more uh, especially in the bhagavatam but can you say about how much uh, creative license you used to make the mahabharata and ramayana appealing and what you are doing with respect to the bhagavatam okay yeah how much creative license poetic license did i use um with the mahabharata and the ramayana they are themselves very already very dramatic um Uh, you know works and uh, you don't need to add a great deal of um uh, of that kind of thing i mean that the, as you say there was a certain amount of um license in revealing the inner dialogue of the of the characters but as much as i possibly could i adhered closely to the to the text of the original um i think that was my primary concern when i was writing uh, over and above anything else was to ensure that i i did not um change the messages that were um you know being conveyed i mean hopefully i understood the messages <laughs> in the first place so that i didn't uh, miss in, mispresent mispresent those in in any way but i i wanted to ensure that i i, I got that right and um so um I would even like with the Mahabharat for example um as you know it's not really been preserved in parampara it hasn't it hasn't been the, the the text is not um intact from its original it, uh, there's been interpolations and losses over the years and accretions you know as well so um I, i was very conscious of that and i i would refer to um shrimad bhagavatam which has been preserved by a line of teachers Uh, so i i would defer to that if there was some detail which differed um in mahabharata to bhagavatam i would i would stick with the the shrimad bhagavatam the bhagavat purana uh, because i assumed that to be more accurate um and i would also refer to commentaries by the uh, acharyas and teachers so and the point i'm trying to make here is how um how, how faithful i was trying to be to to the original so that it's not that by my creative license i i took liberties and uh, well, i can just change that a little bit it's not so important I, i i was very cautious that i wasn't going to misrepresent the characters especially and and impute to them um the wrong motives and uh, you know different um uh, ideas of my own creation my own interpretation um i would you know i i really wanted to retain the power um and the beauty of the original yeah it's wonderful and uh, so how are you, now currently i believe you are rendering the bhagavatam so 
and the bhagavatam in one sense is is a much more philosophical book of course there are stories and uh, some of the stories are very dramatic some of the stories are the bhagavatam is more of a book which talks about renouncing or uh, focusing on the spiritual world and turning away from this world so to make it to render it in a way that is appealing was that a significantly bigger challenge oh absolutely uh, i mean <laughs> i've been working on this for um 20 years um and it's gone through different um incarnations <laughs> and metamorphoses um i i completed it at one point and then i you know it's ready to publish and then i thought I, i'm not happy with it and i you know went back and started again completely from the beginning to work on it because you know i i'm not qualified really i i don't the shrimad bhagavatam is, is is the most elevated um writing um of all writings it, it it's giving us the distilled essence of the absolute truth um and as you say it's you know it it does have some nice stories in there but as you say it's it's really meant for taking us away from the mundane away from the the trivial uh, and the material things you know that that attract us in this world which you find in the mahabharata the mahabharata has romance it has intrigue you know it it has all kinds of things as violence as you say the wars and that um and it's 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 very appealing to the um to the mundane mind uh, and although the shrimad bhagavatam seems to have some of that uh, it's much more focused on the pure spiritual message so but it's a challenge to read it never mind for me to write it and present it to others and and that was the reason why i thought well let me try to do that because i i i you know i discovered that many people can't read it at all like my own children i've got three children they're all grown up now um and i you know i realized they weren't reading shrimad bhagavatam it was too daunting they would pick up the first canto and start trying to read it and then it was like oh it's just too much you know too difficult really to 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 get into and and with the so many the plethora of alternatives that are now there in terms of social media and you know so many different things that you know netflix youtube uh which is vying for their time um the shrimad bhagavatam hardly gets a look in so i thought well maybe i can help by making it a little bit more easy to read and accessible um but then i discovered that that was much more of a of a challenge than i'd originally realized and um because it's it's full of so much beautiful um prayers and philosophy um but it's that you know a, a lot of it it has just the very sparsest amount of detail in terms of the um the drama you know the the backdrop um and so i've had to use more creative license in this case actually than i did with mahabhar and um ramayan uh, and and try to imagine more the more imagination is required the scenery you know with like devahuti and kapila what's going on there what's what's impelling devahuti to speak in this way to reveal her heart to kapila um and you know what did it look like you know where where, where were they you, you know to try and you know visualize what was happening and and where it was taking and, and in each of the stories it's been like that to, to really there's been much more requirement for um creative license in some ways but having said that with the same um you know real desire to ensure that there's no deviation from the actual text that it, it that i stick very very closely to the meaning to the philosophical points that are being presented there so that's the challenge really to you know to couch those philosophical points in attractive language and with dramatic uh you know with a with a dramatic backdrop but not lose the uh the messages at the same time so that's what i'm trying to do and i don't think i'm qualified <laughs> <laughs> I wish someone else could do it. <laughs> Your humility to say they're not qualified. I think you have uh, both. You have the literary capacity and you have the spiritual experience 
I actually came to Krishna consciousness in 1979, actually, so 42, 41, 42 years ago, yeah. Yeah, that's right. I mean, um, this is a very, but, yeah, sorry. sorry. Yeah, I, I was just going to say yeah. that um, I, I find it's very purifying for me. That, 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 that's what's really keeping me going. Yeah. You know, this is always a challenge. What you said that, say, your children were not able to read the Bhagavatam, which was too daunting. So that that is always a challenge that that uh, how do we make things accessible uh, without while also keeping them sort of uh, what is the word for it consistent with the original. So if we focus too much on only on consistency, then it may be that nobody okay we keep the book completely uh, pure in pure and double quotes, but nobody reads it. Then how much is the relevance of that? And in some ways, yeah. And in some ways in our own tradition, there is the whole tradition of writing dramas and Chaitanya Chandra, then Atak and Lit Madha, Vidagda Madha, so many of these dramas, you know, they, they are in a sense, they are themselves called as Natakas or dramas. So it's not that necessarily these are exactly uh, historical events that are revealed and have been written. They can be, of course, but there is a rich tradition of of dramaturgy or of dramaturgy in our in our tradition also, and where certain certain characters are dressed in particular ways. Now we don't have ex exhaustive description of how somebody was dressed. We use our imagination to decide how they should be dressed. And then not all the dialogues in a drama will be exact replicas of the dialogues from the from the books. So there is a certain amount of uh, not only sometimes the word license uses a license involves the word that okay you can do it within limits, but doing it is not just uh, something which is allowed, but it is actually essential. Without doing that, the epics won't be relevant. So. It's a, I read your Bhagavatam and it's striking. You know, it is, it is a, you can be easily drawn into the conversation and the thought flow. And then one thing is, one major difference I found between the Bhagavatam and the Mahabharata is, in the Bhagavatam, you are given a lot of end notes where you explain. So for those who want to do the deeper study, then the end notes are there. And for those who want to read it in a dramatic way, that is also there. So in a sense, the yes. book, book offers something for the light reading and it offers something for the serious readers also. Yes, that, that, that was what we, um, I, I'm doing this with my wife, by the way, it's a, it's a collaboration. Um, but yeah, we wanted to, um, eventually we, we decided that we wanted to ensure that it would be valuable as a study guide, as a companion book for um, the original, you know, for Srila Prabhupada's basically. So yeah, we've gone through every verse and tried to unpack the meaning um, to the best of our ability. And then um, where necessary, we've provided those end notes and appendices also um, to explain where we're getting some of our uh, understandings from because we've referred not just to Srila Prabhupada, but also to some of the other Acharyas. Um, you know, to the commentaries of other Acharyas, which we've had access to. So um, we've, th th therefore, we've provided the, um, the references all the time, you know, to ensure that no one thinks that we're making things up ourselves, because we're not, <laughs> we're not able to do that, of course. But as you say, I mean, there, there is a tradition of, um, of drama uh, in, in the Vedic um, culture, and, uh, and our Acharyas have shown that. And of course, the Mahabharata, and the um, Ramayana are nice examples of that uh, to start with. And then, as you say, um, like the Goswamis and Rupa Goswami with his writings that you've just mentioned um, and others. Um, and uh, back to Notakor wrote a novel, <laughs> you know, <laughs> which uh, illustrates the philosophy. So one of the great teachers in our line, he wrote a novel. So, yeah, it's, um, it's, it's definitely part of our thing. I, I don't think there's any problem with that. And as you say, if you, you know, you can just keep it very pure um, and then that's great, but nobody reads it. 
and what's the point? Um, and, and I think that really comes down to the dichotomy which always exists, in fact, in religions you find that there, there's on the one side the, the school of pure and small, you know, <laughs> exclusive, that those who are like sincere and everything, that, that they'll relish it and that's okay, and, and those who are not, well, never mind, one day maybe they will be. Uh, and then the other side who are like, no, no, let's open it up as much as we can to make it uh, available to everyone. But but you have to draw a fine line because, you know, there's something to be said for both sides. And um, you don't want to go too much either way. Um, you don't want to go all the way to the side of appealing to other people so much so that you water everything down, you compromise your messages, um, and nothing's left. Because then you lose the power. Because these texts, they're not just stories. They're very powerful, transformative texts that can completely change your life. If you, if you enter into the understanding and the meaning of them, then like the, the Srimad Bhagavatam said, it's meant to bring about a revolution in consciousness, you know, to completely transform your paradigm from what it is now to something else, to something glorious, to something uplifting that takes you to another world. So you don't want to lose that. You, you want to make sure that you're still getting the full force of that power. Uh, but at the same time, um, it, it has to be in an assimilable way, in an accessible way. Uh, and, and Prabhupada himself obviously tried for that. I mean, why did he translate them into English, you know, from the original Sanskrit and write his elaborate purports because of that very reason, so that we can access that, you know. So there is that tradition, as you say. Yes. Mm. So I just, uh, maybe to conclude, how, how can devotees in India get your books? You said you have a new publisher now. Are they also available? In yeah, yeah, they are actually available. They're, they've just recently been released. I think you'll find them on Amazon and they're probably in most major outlets. I think bookshops should be having them now. Um, they've got a new cover from what they used to have, but... <laughs> Okay. But they've got my name on the card. <laughs> okay, so so you'll find them, yes, they're definitely available in India. Even the Bhagavatam also? Or the Mahabharata? Um, the Bhagavatam, yes. It's not available um, in hard copies, unfortunately, because at the moment we're self-publishing it and it's print on demand. So the only way you can get it in India is Kindle, is the e-book, unfortunately. Uh, we do have hopes to... Um, make them available uh, in, in the future. But at the moment, we're, we're not able to do that. So, uh, but you can get the ebook. Most people have Kindles these days. That's true. So I'm sure that devotees, especially who want to, st not only study the Ramayana and Mahabharata, but the Bhagavatam also will find this very helpful to absorb oneself in the mood and the characters of the Bhagavatam so that we can assist yeah. more. Yes, true. Oh, absolutely. I mean, the Srimad Bhagavatam frees us from all pain and suffering. That's the whole point of the book. And, you know, I, I couldn't recommend it highly enough. <laughs> yes. So I'll just try to summarize what we discuss. And then if you have any concluding words, you can add that. I think we discuss on the topic of, say, the relevance of scripture in today's world. And I talk, we discuss how you, because you out of your personal inspiration with the Ramayana and the Mahabharat and not finding anything which was not too stilted, you rendered the Ramayana and the Mahabharat. And it's interesting that it seems in the West, Mahabharat is more popular, India, Ramayana is more popular. But still, these, these epics have enduring values which can appeal to all of humanity, spiritual values, ethical values. And uh, I like the point you said about how the epics you don't uh, tell me, show me. So they teach values not by in a didactic way, but simply through the narration. And uh, <clears throat> you focused on let whenever there are any controversial issues through the dialogues and through the epics narrative frame itself, you try to anticipate and address those. And uh, we discuss the issue of violence that these are more like to establish righteousness. And if you look at the broader context, the point is uh, to establish, point is not to glorify the violence, but this point is to recognize that every society for maintaining law and order does need some amount of violence. 
So then lastly, I talked about the creative license and the Bhagavatam. So the challenge between keeping something pure and making something accessible. So by entering into the characters and framing their th framing dialogues, the scripture can become much more appealing. So um, it was wonderful having this discussion with you, bro. Anything, any concluding you. you would like to say? Um, just thank you very much for having me on. And um, uh, if anyone's interested to find out more about my books, I have a website. Um, if you just Google my name, in fact, Krishna Dharma, uh, then you'll, you'll find all different links. Uh, and anyone who wants to directly contact me with any questions regarding anything I've said today, of course, and plus um, from my books, they're very welcome to do so. Um, you, you can find me, as I say, via my website or um, Facebook. I have a page. It's called the Krishna Dharma page. Yeah. To make it easy. And uh, I'm also on Twitter. So various places. Uh, and I always welcome um, any uh, questions, queries, and indeed suggestions and corrections, because I'm only too aware that um, there may be faults in, in my presentation. So I'm happy to hear about those also. My but God. thank you very much for having me on today. Thank you very much. Humble obeisances to Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna Prabhuji. Hare Krishna. Okay.